for again the first speaker for today for the afternoon session is uh, uh, Zahara Matilin from the Novos Pacific State University and the Laurentian French School of Hydrodynamics. So he will be talking about a new class of integrable to component systems of hydrodynamic types. So Zahara, please start. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to me to give a talk here at this conference. So our work is devoted to the following two component system of hydrodynamic type. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you, do you see my point or my arrow? Huh? Yeah, 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 we can, we can uh, see it, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. So it is well known fact that for such a type system, uh, there are Riemann invariants. However, to construct Riemann invariants in explicit closed form, one should solve linear PDE with variable coefficients, which is in general an unsolvable problem. Alternatively, one can use the generalized hydrograph method, but we still need to solve linear PDE with variable coefficients. So we present you the class of two component hydrodynamic type system for which this corresponding linear PDE has infinitely many particular explicit solutions. And this class is defined by quadratic Hamiltonian density of, uh, which is defined by this formula with A, B, C and arbitrary analytic functions. So let me recall uh, what generalized photograph method is. This method relies on a concept of uh, commuting flow, which uh, is a hydrodynamic type system as well. Uh, and to find the densities for commuting flow F, uh, one should solve this linear PDE, which is now, uh, so this one, number three, where function H is given by this formula. And then the solution of the original system can be obtained by the following explicit formulas once F is uh, founded by someone. Okay, we have the correspondence between the solution of this PDE in our original system of equation. So look at this equation in details. This is the second order linear PDE. And it means that the general solution uh, depends on two arbitrary constants. And here you can see the following definitions. The first definition tells us that this equation is called solvable if it possesses just infinitely many particular solutions and each of them can be found from corresponding linear ODE. Uh, in second definition, uh, uh, we call this equation uh, completely solvable if it possesses two infinite series of particular solutions. Uh, it means that the, the solution depends on two arbitrary constants. And it turns out that in the case of quadratic Hamiltonian density H, we are able to construct two infinite series of solutions, just solving ODE of second order. <clears throat> so now let's write down our equation in explicit form and looking for solution of this equation in the polynomial form with arbitrary K greater than two one obtains the following system of second order ODEs. So here you can see that the first equation is decoupled from each other. And it defines the right hand side of the second equation. The second equation defines the right hand side of the third equation and so on. Also, you can see that the left hand side of the first equation of the second equation, third and so on, are coincide up to a constant, uh, which is here. Uh, so it means that to solve the whole system of this ODE, it is sufficient to solve just first uh, ordinary differential equation. 
So to make sure that our class is meaningful, we present some physically relevant examples. The first example is a toy model of the thin liquid layer motion on the rotating cylinder surface. So this system was firstly obtained in the paper by Mikhail Zhukov and his student Adel Marat. Uh, R is a free surface equation here. Gamma is velocity circulation. And introducing this variable, it is easy to see that this uh, system belongs to our class uh, with uh, such a Hamiltonian density. So the second class and more, uh, more important example is a two layer non bosinex shallow water system in infinite channel. So here, rho is the density in upper and lower layer correspondingly. H is the total height of the channel. Xi is the relative thickness. And sigma is the momentum shear. And so how to, excuse me. better. Uh -huh. So here, introducing the dimensionless variables here and Bucinus parameter R, we see that this system is also belongs to our class with such a Hamiltonian density. And we focus, uh, we will focus on this system further. Uh, it is well known fact that in Bucinus limit when R tends to zero, uh, we obtained the following Hamiltonian density and uh, our origin system of equation is equivalent to the shallow water system uh, by this, by the following transformation. Uh, and the shallow water system is known to possess Riemann invariants in closed form, but we want to get the solution of the full problem. So let's consider the, this Hamiltonian density. So for this Hamiltonian density, our corresponding linear PDE has the following form with uh, the functions A, B, and C, which is represented here in explicit form. Uh, and the system of ODEs for coefficients J, K, I, of the commuting flows uh, can be obtained by solving this system of ODs. And here you can see that there are two decoupled equations, the first one and the second one. And it means that our general solution uh, will depend on four arbitrary constants. Uh, let's look at the first equation. So according to the general theory of analytic ODEs, uh, we can construct its solution in uh, closed form and its structure is presented here. So here the coefficients P, Q and Psi can be determined uniquely just under substitution this formula back to this equation. So it is easy to see that the second equation has the same structure of its general solution. So it means that we, we are able to construct these functions j, k, k and j, k, k, k minus one in explicit closed form. And thus uh, we are able to define all right hand sides and uh, to obtain the general uh, solution of this equation, uh, of, uh, of the whole system of ODs. Okay, having obtained the, uh, the solution of uh, the system of ODs, we can construct the solution of the original system of the origin system uh, by using the implicit formulas. And you can see here that this solution for 
time t uh, consists of four arbitrary constants here, c21, uh, c31, c32, and c22. And also you, you can see here some rational functions, logarithms, and it looks rather complicated. Uh, the same situation uh, is for x. These formulas are much more complicated. And here you can see the d logarithm or Spence, uh, Spence function. This is a special function, of course. Uh, here, chi represents the polynomial with respect to u and v of degree i and j respectively. For example, look at this uh, chi three. This is a polynomial with respect to u of degree five and with respect to v of degree two uh, with coefficients being polynomials in R, Bucinus parameter. Uh, the similar notation is used for chi with uh, the only one upper index. So uh, it is easy to see that these formulas for x uh, equals to says x capital of u and v and for t equals to, for example, t capital of u, v define uh, the surface in corresponding three dimensional space. And we can uh, take level sets of this surface and to draw some pictures which is represented here on this slide. <clears throat> so here the upper pictures A, B and C represents the function T capital of U and V equals to some constants. The constants here is given by six, four, two, two, zero, minus two, minus four, and minus six. The same situation uh, with the, the lower pictures. D, E, and F, this is the pictures, this is the level set of the function X, capital of U and V. For the X, uh, the same as, uh, for the X having values the same as for T, six, four, two, zero, minus two, and so on. Uh, this is the colored lines. Uh, the red line, red solid line, uh, represents the zero of the Jacobian of our Hadograph transformation. So here, the vertical axis is U, the horizontal axis is V, and this is so-called Hadograph plane. Uh, the dashed, uh, red line, this is the hyperbolic elliptic boundary. It means that this domain is uh, the hyperbolicity domain and the rest is a uh, bound, uh, this is a domain of ellipticity. Also, all these pictures are drawn for different uh, values of uh, our arbitrary constants C, uh, I, J says. So here, uh, and also we said for all pictures, the Bucinus parameter equals to 0 0.3. So here, this is, uh, we obtained some Gadograph pictures and we should uh, obtain the solution of the origin system by inverting this uh, Gadograph transformation. So now uh, we can do it we can do it uh, on the so-called, on the curve, which is called isochrome. What does it mean? It means that we can construct the solution in explicit uh, parametric form at instant time t star. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, how much time do I have? Satiris. Hello. Sorry, sorry, I had my microphone switched off. Uh, so you have around 15 minutes. Uh -huh. It's much more <laughs> than I need. Okay, so how to construct these solutions? Uh, first of all, we need to 
take some curve t star equals to t of u and v. Uh, let's take the t star equals to minus 2.07 and so on. Uh, so do you see this, uh, these values? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, yes, we can. Okay, okay, it's very good. So uh, let's set T star equals to minus two, uh, zero seven and so on. This is a blue line, which is represented here. After that, let us set X star equals to 1.89 and so on. This is the black line here. And solving the equations t star equals to t of u and v and the corresponding x star equals to x of u and v we obtain the values uh, of u0 and v0 the values of this point this point thus we get the initial data for the following initial value problem solving this problem we obtain and the solution in the parametric form. Here, mu is the parameter along this blue curve. It means that we obtain the solution u of mu and uh, v of mu and x of mu along this blue curve. And it means that we get the parametric form of our solution u over x at, in, at instant t star and v over x at, inst, at instant t star, I'm sorry. Uh, so, and uh, by iteration of this procedure uh, using all these curves, this is uh, the color curves uh, corresponds to different times, we obtain the following solution. This is the parametric form of our solution u over x four different times. So by varying the t star, we obtain these curves. Uh, from right to left, this corresponds to t star equals uh, to minus four. This is for minus three. This is minus 2.07. Uh, uh, this is minus one, zero, one, two, uh, 2 2.6. Uh, and it is easy to see that this dashed purple line corresponds to the x uh, equals to our x star, uh, which is 1.89 uh, and so on. And it turned out that this is the point where our solution breaks. It is easy to see here that this point, uh, uh, so this point is breaking point of our solution. It means that our solution uh, touches the zero of Jacobian of our uh, Gadograph transformation here. Uh, and all these lines represented here. This is for T star equals to minus four minus three minus 2.07 and so on. This is minus one, zero, uh, one, two, two point six. And these curves uh, intersects our, uh, the red line in two points. It means that we have uh, two vertical tangent lines to our solution. Uh, of course, this solution after breaking become physically irrelevant, but uh, theoretically it, it can give us some useful information. For example, uh, the domain between uh, two vertical tangents uh, can represent, for example, the modulation domain for the corresponding dispersive system of equation. Uh, anyway, this is a very recent result, and we should, uh, of course, we should uh, 
uh, interpret this picture uh, very carefully and to realize how to interpret. But this is, uh, as I said, recent result and the work is still in progress. Uh, I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So are there any questions or remarks? Okay, no questions from the audience. Uh, are there any questions by the online participants? Uh, okay, probably not. So in which case we may thank the speaker again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the first speaker of this session is uh, Stefano Wabnitz from uh, Rome, and uh, he will be talking about uh, spatiotemporal soliton bullet dynamics in nonlinear multimode optical fibers. So, Stefano, you can start when you're ready. Thank you. I, I wonder if you see also my picture or just to this. Uh, we, we see uh, the first slide of your of your uh, of your talk uh, with the title and affiliations and logos. So that's all we see. You can hear me. Okay, good. So as you uh, as you mentioned, thanks thanks a lot, uh, Sotiris, for organizing and uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, meeting. Unfortunately, I'm not able. Uh, to be in person this time. So I would like to, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, uh, Spatiotemporal Soliton Ballet Dynamics in Nonlinear Multimode Optical Fibers. And uh, I would like to thank my co-workers, in particular uh, Mario Zitelli, who has been uh, leading uh, the experiments uh, in my lab in Rome. And it's also a collaboration with Enis Karenko at the University of uh, Novosibirsk. So I would like to, uh, first of all, for uh, those who would like to familiarize with uh, multi-mode nonlinear fiber optics, I would like to point out uh, a recent review paper that appeared uh, less than a year ago uh, on, uh, on this topic. So here is the outline of the presentation. So first of all, I would like to uh, give a motivation to study nonlinear multimode fiber optics. Uh, so what, uh, where is the interest from the point of view of applications and fundamental uh, physics? Uh, and then I will uh, move to one particular of uh, those physical phenomena that is uh, the propagation of multimode solitons. And uh, I will describe uh, numerical simulations, but mostly experiments that support uh, those simulations. And um, in particular, uh, uh, what we study is the dynamics of uh, the solitons in the, in the spectral domain, in the domain of the uh, frequency domain. And um, then the, the presence of uh, nonlinear losses that accompany the propagation. So optical fibers are typically considered as a, uh, for a short uh, length as a lossless uh, material uh, with uh, simply a linear loss, but our experiments uh, reveal the presence of a nonlinear loss process. So it is a, in fact a dissipative uh, system uh, that describes the pulse propagation. So we did the characterization in the time and in the spatial domain also of the solitons. And uh, we uh, reproduced uh, the essentials of the fission of an initial pulse into multiple solitons by numerical simulations. And we compared, uh, we carried out a, a comparison between uh, uh, numerics experiments and also uh, some analytical formula, which were derived in the frame of the 1D nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, which can uh, describe uh, uh, for example, the shift of the soliton wavelength under the influence of, Ra of Raman scattering. So in terms of uh, motivation, so why uh, it is inter interesting to study multimode optical fibers? Uh, well, because uh, from the point of view of applications, <coughs> they are uh, able to increase the capacity of optical communication systems. 
um, through the technique of uh, space division multiplexing, that is uh, sending, uh, increase the capacity by sending in parallel many spatial channels so using multiple modes of the uh, multi-mode fibers. Uh, so there is a lot of work uh, since uh, in the last 10 years on this topic from an industrial point of view. And also they are important because uh, uh, they have a larger cross section. And so you can uh, substantially increase uh, the amount of energy uh, that is uh, delivered by laser sources for many high power applications. Now fiber lasers are uh, even uh, candidates for uh, um, experiments in high energy physics uh, to, uh, to, uh, to accelerate uh, particles, to replace conventional, conventional uh, particle uh, accelerators. So from the, uh, in terms of a motivation more from a fundamental point of view, uh, uh, multi-mode optical fibers also are a test bed to study uh, complex and nonlinear systems. And uh, one example is uh, uh, of those uh, is the propagation of multi-mode solitons. Uh, I will uh, come back to that because that is the main topic of this presentation. But there are other effects uh, like uh, in uh, fiber lasers, you can achieve uh, spatial temporal mode locking that is a simultaneous locking of uh, modes uh, of the temporal modes or frequency modes and also spatial modes, transverse modes. Uh, spectral broadening, uh, which is a multi-mode uh, uh, with high brightness. So generation of, uh, for example, uh, in, in injecting a near infrared or infrared laser pulse, you get a, a series of sidebands in the visible, a sort of optical rainbow. And also beam cleaning uh, of, uh, induced by the care effect of uh, um, which is a pure spatial effect that is uh, modes uh, uh, get uh, self-organized in the spatial domain and uh, uh, as the power is increased uh, and, uh, there is a reorganization of the uh, of the spatial output of the fiber uh, with the, uh, which is analogous to Bose-Einstein condensation. So uh, what are multi-mode fibers? Uh, well multi-mode fibers are uh, well, maybe I just add uh, here. A pointer. So what is a multi-mode fiber? Well, it's just a single mode fiber uh, with a larger uh, size of the core. And uh, there are different types of uh, multi-mode fibers, graded index, uh, where the index uh, varies uh, parabolically across the core, or a step index, where you have just a, a jump of the refractive index in the core. Uh, so they are nice. You can propagate many rays or many modes but uh, you lose uh, the quality of the beam because uh, the output, uh, of course, from a single mode fiber, you just get a nice Gaussian beam, uh, uh, which is uh, the, the shape, which represents the shape of the single mode that propagates through it. But in multi-mode fibers, you have an interference of many modes, which leads to speckles. So highly irregular pattern, uh, intensity patterns uh, resulting from the interference of all the modes, and that is very sensitive to any perturbation. So it's uh, the, the output intensity pattern looks uh, pretty chaotic. Uh, among the, uh, those uh, uh, nonlinear multimode, I mean, uh, different multimode fibers for nonlinear optics, uh, it is uh, interesting to use uh, graded index fibers. Why is that? Well. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the modal dispersion is low because of uh, uh, the modes, uh, because of the graded index profile, all modes uh, tend to travel with the same velocity. So modes which are injected, rays which go with an angle, they see uh, basically a lower refractive index on average, so they travel faster than, mo than modes that are injected on axis. And so overall, uh, there is an equalization of the group velocity of all modes, so which means that all the modes uh, are um, interacting for a long length. So you get really uh, nonlinear optics uh, with many, uh, with the interaction of many modes. But also there is an interesting effect that, uh, that is a self-imaging, that is the beam is periodically oscillating, the intensity of the beam periodically oscillates and reproduces the, the input beam at different points in the fiber. And why is that? Well, because uh, as you can see uh, on this uh, slide, 
um, in a graded index uh, fiber, uh, there are groups of modes which, show, which, are, uh, which have all the same, which are nearly degenerate. They have the same propagation constant. And uh, these modes are uh, equally spaced. They, they are spaced by the same uh, amount in the spatial frequency domain. So that's why uh, when you superimpose all of that, you get something periodic in, in space because the spatial frequency is a superposition of like a Fourier series is a superposition of modes which uh, have equally uh, spaced uh, propagation constants. And that, that leads to this periodic evolution of the beam. So uh, what about the linear propagation in a, in a green fiber? Linear propagation of three modes to simplify, it's, uh, it's very simple, it's just ruled by uh, the phase velocity, group velocity and group velocity dispersion. And if you have a short pulse, because each mode has its own group velocity, then the three, three modes will split, will separate after some distance. So there is a walk off uh, in time between the modes. On the other hand, if you have a long pulse, you don't, have a, you don't see this splitting because the pulse is, uh, is very long. So you just uh, see this periodic evolution of self-imaging that I mentioned before. Uh, now coming to uh, multi-mode fiber solitons. Uh, so what happens when you add the nonlinearity? And multi-mode fiber solitons were uh, uh, already predicted uh, or uh, studied uh, theoretically by Azegawa uh, 40 years ago. And what is uh, uh, the difference between a multi-mode fiber soliton and a single-mode fiber soliton? Well, um, nonlinearity compensates not only for chromatic dispersion, but also for modal dispersion. So there is, a, uh, Azegawa derived the soliton trapping condition by some uh, approximation, uh, basically nonlinearity X as a trapping potential for all the modes. And uh, yeah, if the nonlinearity is high enough, then uh, all the modes are uh, trapped by this potential and they cannot escape. Uh, and uh, uh, the multi-mode beam uh, propagates uh, together. So you can see, for example, here a numerical simulation when uh, basically there are many solitons uh, that results from soliton fission. And each of them is composed by multiple modes, uh, which are indicated by the different colors. And the higher order modes travel with, because they are trapped by nonlinearity, by cross-phase modulation with a fundamental mode, which is the blue pulse. So they all travel together uh, with the same group velocity, uh, in spite of the fact that the linear group velocity is different. So how do we understand this in a simple way? Well, we can just consider the, uh, the simple case uh, when you have just two modes, for example, uh, a barifringent fiber, you have the two polarization modes, and uh, what happens in the case of a barifringent fiber, you have a two different group velocity for the two modes, but again, you have nonlinearity. So uh, what happens in nonlinearity, essentially what it does is that it shifts the spectrum uh, along the two polarizations so that uh, uh, this, uh, the frequency shift uh, is, uh, leads to a uh, chromatic dispersion to also a group velocity shift, which is exactly equal and opposite to the um, the group velocity shift, uh, which is due to barefringence. So basically, nonlinearity shifts the spectrum so that uh, uh, the chromatic dispersion induced uh, frequency shift is equal to the frequency shift induced by barefringence. So the two polarizations uh, in, uh, travel together. The, you get a trapped soliton in the two polarizations. And uh, so, for uh, again, uh, to, to give a simplified case of a multi-mode soliton now is just an extended multi-dimensional version of a barifringent, I mean, a two-mode two soliton that I described before. So, for example, in a nonlinear propagation of three modes, when you add the nonlinearity, but all the modes now travel in unison. So you see that all the modes have the same, because of this nonlinear induced frequency shifts, uh, now the group velocity is exactly the same. and. Uh, uh, the, the pulse uh, propagates as a superposition of many modes, uh, even though in linear conditions they would separate. So the walk off in time is compensated by the Kerr effect. Uh, in fact, the first observation of multi-mode fiber soliton uh, is quite, uh, I mean, uh, goes back in time to the group of uh, Prokhorov and Yanov at uh, General Physics Institute. So it was uh, just a short letter 
uh, JTP letters, uh, and they they generated uh, multiple solitons by simply injecting a, a, a long pulses in the uh, at one micron, and then because of Raman frequency shift, uh, uh, they got a super continuum and uh, uh, which uh, uh, extended over the anomalous dispersion regime. And so they were able over a few hundred meters uh, to generate a soliton in the anomalous dispersion regime. And it was interesting that uh, the soliton duration uh, uh, remained uh, constant. So we're even uh, 500 meters. Uh, they, they, you got uh, in the near infrared uh, short pulse, uh, which is also nearly single mode. So the, the pump, uh, which is a normal dispersion regime, is highly multimode. That is the special profile. Uh, which is speckled, so it doesn't have a nice uh, spatial coherence, but in the, the, the soliton has a, has, a, has a bell shape. So, uh, in fact, uh, it was, uh, its uh, spatial shape uh, is quite close to the shape of the fundamental mode. So even though the fiber is highly multimode, uh, there's a soliton that emerged from this complex uh, nonlinear interaction process was uh, close to the fundamental mode of the fiber. So there was, a, since 1988, nobody else studied experimentally multimode solitons. There was, a, uh, the, there was basically almost a 25 years lag of time, lag, lag of time. And then the next experiment was at the Cornell group where they did a more uh, detailed characterization of multimode solitons, again, to compare linear propagation when the pulse splits into the in a green fiber into the component solitons and the multimode soliton case where the pulse stays together. Uh, but in, so the one way to describe uh, in a graded index fiber, uh, multimode soliton propagation is through the 3D plus one uh, linear Schrodinger equation, also known as gross pitayevsky equation. So you have a two diffraction, two terms that describe a spatial diffraction, then a group velocity dispersion, uh, the parabolic uh, potential, which is the refractive index profile, and then kernel linearity. In their espresso, there is an approximate analytical solution for a soliton bullet uh, that is obtained by a variational method, which was pretty close to their experiment because, in fact, in their experiments, they are a little bit cheating because they, they were studying the quasi single mode regime. You know, more than 90% of the input beam was already uh, injected into fundamental mode. So there was not a substantial, uh, there was not really a multimode regime. So there was a subsequent paper a few a couple of years later where they actually excited eight modes, uh, the input, uh, and they observed, uh, for example, the, the spatial pattern of the beam of the soliton uh, that was generated uh, uh, through soliton fission. And if you isolate the soliton that is generated, you get a, a very nice uh, beam, uh, again, like in uh, Diano's uh, Grudini experiments, uh, which is almost a single mode, which has a nice Gaussian shape. So what we have uh, done uh, next is uh, uh, to, to study in some, uh, somehow to, to, to continue this study of multimode solitons, but uh, in a rather extreme uh, regime uh, by injecting uh, very short pulses uh, around 100 femtoseconds. In previous experiments were five, about five times longer. And uh, uh, we also injected as much uh, peak power as possible uh, before reaching the damage of the fiber. So we tried to push to the extreme uh, the, the propagation, to, to study novel uh, propagation regime. And we just used, in these experiments, uh, 30 centimeters of fiber. We have now uh, new experiments going on where we observe very interesting effects where we use one kilometer of fiber, but I will not have uh, time to discuss today. So the experimental setup is the following. There is a laser source that uh, pumps an optical parametric uh, amplifier that uh, generates a, uh, a femtosecond pulse in the anomalous dispersion regime. And we observe this uh, pulse by camera in the spatial domain, in the temporal domain by an autocorrelator, in the spectral domain by spectrometer and optical spectrum analyzer. So we do a full, we do a full 3D uh, characterization. So here is an example of the spectral dynamics of soliton fission because the input pulse, uh, uh, as the energy increases, uh, it will generate many solitons. So that is at the end of the 30 centimeters by increasing what happens in the spectrum as we increase the input energy. So as you can see that initially, uh, 
for low energies, we just have the initial spectrum and then the spectrum breaks and the soliton is generated that shifts to longer wavelengths because of the soliton cell frequency shift effect. Uh, and then other solitons are generated uh, when the energy increases. But as you can see, after about 100 nanojoules of input energy, the soliton cell frequency shift stops. So uh, if the, 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 the theory for uh, soliton cell frequency shift in a, uh, in a standard, uh, in a single mode fibers predicts that this, with, uh, as you increase the power, this continues to increase linearly. But actually here we see a saturation of the effect. And then also there is a generation of dispersive waves in the normal dispersion regime. So what is associated with this saturation? Well, we can, uh, uh, we explored uh, actually the, the energy transmission of the fiber. So that is a simply, we plot as a function of input energy, the output energy. And then you can see that above 100 nanojoules, there is a saturation. So the fiber is no longer a linear medium. The, there is a limiting of the energy, a saturation of the output energy. So it's, uh, we, uh, we say that the output energy clamps for input energies above 100 nanojoules. And uh, this means that above 100 nanojoules, there is an entirely new uh, propagation regime, which is dominated by nonlinear loss mechanism, which is uh, at that time, uh, it was quite mysterious. And then we have been studying this mechanism, but we didn't have a clue what was the origin. And uh, of course, if the uh, energy is lost uh, in the fiber in the first centimeters, uh, then uh, uh, even if you increase the input energy, the, the energy that comes out of the, from the fiber is constant and that explains why uh, the soliton uh, cell frequency shift uh, stops. And in fact, we understood that uh, this, uh, the origin of this uh, mechanism of uh, anolinear loss is multi-photon absorption, which leads uh, to scattering of fluorescence of energy due to uh, in fact uh, some defects of the fiber and the germanium doping. So that is uh, the presence of impurities and doping at, at such a high uh, pulse energy is, uh, is responsible for losses of up to 80% of the input energy. So it is a nonlinear loss mechanism that was never observed before, but which has a deep influence on soliton propagation. And in order to better understand it, we also did a cutback experiment. That is, uh, we looked at uh, what happens to the spectrum of the solitons as you uh, go from 30 centimeters uh, uh, to five centimeters or so closer to the input end of the fiber. So you see that in fact, you generate uh, a wavelength multiplex. So you generate uh, different solitons which have uh, different wavelengths uh, and they first appear already after seven centimeters as a result of soliton fission. And uh, we also again characterized more the nonlinear loss of the fiber in terms of uh, how the transmitted energy evolves as a function of fiber length. And uh, you can see that for high input energies, again, you have about 80% drop of the transmission already over the first few centimeters of the fiber. And then the energy remains constant. And we, by autocorrelation, so we, we were able to measure directly the pulse duration, so to, to characterize also in the time domain the duration of pulses. And there are experiments where you see actually when you have three peaks in the autocorrelation, it means that you have a pair of solitons, so the generation of a molecule, a soliton molecule, let's say. Or uh, in other experiments, we, we have a single peak, that is uh, we have, a, in this case, for example, a single soliton at 2,000 uh, nanometers uh, uh, with only 71 uh, femtoseconds pulse duration. So even shorter than uh, the input pulse duration. Uh, as uh, they, these are spatial temporal solitons, so it's also again important to, to characterize them in the spatial domain. What is the, the, the beam profile associated with these solitons? And uh, to do that, uh, we, we put a long pass filter to cut out all the radiation. And so if you don't do that, if you don't put the filter, you get the speckles at the output. So that is the beam, uh, how it looks like the output of the fiber. But if you just isolate the soliton, you get a nice uh, single spot, so a clean Gaussian beam. So the soliton, it is uh, very pure uh, also spatially. It has a bell shape, a spatial profile, almost diffraction limited. So it's a really uh, um, a sort of a spatial temporal ballet, which is localized in space, uh, in time and in wavelength. Uh, numerically, how do we did uh, the simulations? So, well, we used the vectorial uh, model, including the two polarizations. 
uh, where we had the diffraction, uh, group velocity difference between the modes, the dispersion, third order, fourth order dispersion, refractive index profile, including the presence of cladding, self steepening, and uh, uh, self and cross phase modulation, and uh, also third order, um, a third harmonic generation, and the Raman effect. So it's a quite uh, uh, complex uh, numerical model, and we did the fine tuning uh, to, to match with the experiment uh, of this model. And, uh, but it's surprising that uh, this uh, complex model, in some cases, uh, it can be reduced to quite a simple uh, uh, limit uh, to this, the standard nonlinear Schrodinger equation with the simply periodically varying nonlinearity. Gamma is a periodically varying function. That is because of, uh, that um, based on the variational method, this uh, self-imaging results into a periodic variation of the area of the beam that is expressed analytically. That is a formula that you get from the variational method. And uh, if the beam area changes, uh, basically you change the, uh, the, the effective area of the beam. So you have an effective model, which is 1D, uh, which is quite accurate. So where you have a periodic variation of the effective area of the beam of the solid and of the fiber. And here we, we compared uh, this uh, uh, theoretical evolution for the effective area with the simulation, the full 3D simulation, 3D plus one, and there is a, an excellent agreement. Of course, in the case when you, uh, uh, this C parameter that controls the amplitude of this beam oscillation, if C is equal to one, this means exciting just the fundamental mode of the fiber, and then you reduce to the single mode case. But if C is different from one, uh, then you have a, a multi-mode beam, but uh, uh, which can be described by a 1D model with a periodically varying nonlinearity. And uh, so by simulations, one can study the efficient dynamics of uh, input pulse. So you see that uh, these, are, these are numerical simulation. The input pulse uh, splits uh, over uh, 10 centimeters of fiber and produces uh, many solitons, but which have uh, comparable pulse width around uh, 50 and 60 femtoseconds. So there is a sort of uh, attractor for the pulse duration of solitons. Even though they are different, they have different wavelengths. So they, all these solitons are situated in the frequency domain in different positions, but they happen to have the same uh, duration. Okay, that is uh, again from the full 3D simulation, uh, the intensity has a, a very high peak that corresponds to the point of fission. And then the, and then the, the, the fast oscillation is uh, due to the intensity variation induced by this periodic variation of the effective area. And also we, we did the comparison between experiments and the simulations. Uh, and uh, we can in this way um, uh, associate uh, the different uh, peaks in the spectra to the different Raman solitons, Raman 1, Raman 2, Raman 3, and so on. And uh, so we could in this way from experiments, we could uh, plot as a function of the output energy, uh, the evolution of the wavelength of this Raman soliton, different Raman solitons generated by the fission. So you see again in the blue area, we are in the linear propagation regime and uh, the wavelength shifts linearly with energy as uh, uh, predicted by the 1D theory for soliton cell frequency shift. When we enter in the green area in the nonlinear loss regime, uh, you have that the, the soliton wavelengths more or less uh, remains constant, actually fluctuates a little bit chaotically. And uh, so we did uh, actually a comparison with analytical formula for the soliton cell frequency shift in the 1D case. And this prediction is uh, very, very accurate in the linear uh, loss regime. So in the absence of these uh, nonlinear losses, which uh, basically clamp or fix the, the energy in the fiber. So the, you have a linear uh, variation with soliton energy of the soliton wavelength, and then some, uh, uh, above 15 nanojoules of energy, you, you get into this uh, nonlinear loss regime where the wavelength of the soliton is more or less fixed for the two Raman solitons, and also the time duration of the soliton is fixed. And uh, also we looked at the, the soliton pulse width as a function of energy. So uh, in, uh, in the linear regime, you will have that uh, the, the pulse duration is, uh, of the soliton generated by the fission is inversely proportional to the, the soliton energy. Again, uh, as uh, for the standard, the, sing uh, the single uh, 
I mean, the scalar from the scalar uh, solution of uh, soliton solution of the scalar NLS equation. Uh, but in the nonlinear Ross regime, you see you have an attractor. So the duration of the, the, um, the soliton remains fixed, uh, whereas the analytical formula would predict uh, that the energy, the duration, the time duration of the solitons would keep decreasing. And uh, finally, we also looked at the soliton order versus energy. So we used again the, the formula for the soliton order from the standard, from the single, from the scalar nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And we see that we generate the solitons, which, have, which are fundamental solitons, which have an order, uh, soliton order n of equal one. So they are not the, the individual solitons generated by the fission are fundamental solitons. But in the nonlinear uh, loss regime, in fact, n is uh, slightly higher than one. And, uh, but again, this is a regime which is highly dissipative. So it cannot be uh, clearly described simply by the uh, the lossless and nonlinear Schrodinger equation. But still, it remains to be understood why we get uh, soliton orders larger than one, which are significantly larger than one in the, in in the nonlinear loss regime. So I will conclude by uh, saying that we observed uh, uh, the fission of uh, high energy and ultra short uh, pulses in a parabolic green fiber. Uh, which generates a train of uh, pulses of, uh, with different wavelengths of multimode solitons, which have equal temporal durations and uh, different energies. And we have, we have identified uh, the usual, besides the linear, the usual linear loss regime, also a new nonlinear loss regime uh, where the pulse duration is fixed, and uh, even then, uh, if the energy increases by more than uh, five times. Uh, in this regime. So there is a strong variation of the energy, but with no change of the pulse duration. And uh, basically the, the, the experiments uh, be, uh, that we carried out permit to describe, describe what is the range of validity, validity of a, a reduced uh, single mode uh, description for uh, multimode solitons, but uh, uh, the theory for the full uh, nonlinear regime in the presence of nonlinear losses must still be developed. So I thank you for your attention and uh, uh, I'm open to any questions if there is still time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Okay, no questions from the audience, maybe by the online participants, any questions or remarks? Well, in this case, let's uh, thank again the speaker. Thanks, Stefano, so much. Thank you. To, thank you to you. So, so I, will, yeah, I will stop now the okay the, the sharing. Yeah, yeah. You need to yes, yeah. Great. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, now you stopped it. Thanks. So, the next uh, speaker for today is Vladimir Yerzikov. Uh, Volodya, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, maybe you. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yes. You. You see my uh, screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. It's perfect. So, the next uh, speaker for today is Vladimir Yelzikov, and he will be talking about recursion operators and hierarchies of MKDB type equations related to the Katz Moody algebras A51 and A52. So, Volodya, please, you can start. Okay. Thank you very much, Sutiris. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee and Sotiris, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, interesting conference. Uh, okay, so this is uh, work uh, in which uh, participated also two of my former graduate students, uh, Stefanov and uh, Verbev. And uh, it is based uh, just a moment. What happens? Uh, it is based on uh, uh, several papers of ours. One of these papers is the PhD thesis of uh, Verbev, and the other two are published in these journals. There were also other uh, papers, but uh, I think this will be enough. 
for the report that I am going to do. So first, uh, let me say a few words about uh, the general uh, uh, properties of the uh, integrable equations. So they all have flux representations and uh, the history started first with the KDV equation. Uh, and there were a series of papers by Gardner, Green, Kruskal and Mura uh, in 64 to 68. And then Lux concluded uh, this series of papers. And uh, so they uh, proposed a method for exact solutions for the KDV equation, which is uh, this one. And uh, the method of uh, do solving it is now well known as the inverse scattering method. Namely, this equation can be represented as the commutativity condition of two uh, operators. Now they are called Lux pair, L and M. And uh, the Lux operator for KDV equation is the uh, sturm liouville operator, which is uh, like this, where the potential U depends uh, not only on X, but also on the time. And then the, uh, the time dependence of the uh, eigenfunctions is uh, determined by the M operator in the Lux pair. Uh, for several years, uh, this was the only integrable equation, but in 1971, Zaharov and Chabat found the second integrable equation. Now it is known as the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and it has this form. Uh, so it is uh, for complex valued function now, and it has cubic uh, second order with respect to X and cubic nonlinearity. It has uh, a wide uh, physical uh, applications and uh, uh, it became very useful for many uh, uh, regions of in physics and also in mathematics. Now, the Lux pair, I haven't put it here, but it is related to the uh, Lie algebra SL2. Namely, these are two by two matrices. The third uh, equation that appeared was uh, proposed by Vadachi. It was the modified KDV equation. And it is different from the KDV equation by that uh, here we have U squared and not U. Okay, it is equivalent uh, to the KDV equation and uh, these two equations are related by the well-known Mura transformation. Uh, okay. Let me now uh, say some words about the Lux representations of the uh, classes of modified KDV equations that we are going to consider. So this, uh, they will be related to Lie algebras of higher rank, and uh, they will be first order with respect to the X derivative and with respect to the time derivative. And uh, their potentials U and V will be like that. U is linear in the spectral parameter lambda. Uh, v is a polynomial uh, of some power with respect to the spectral parameter. J and K are constant diagonal matrices. And now the compatibility condition, namely the condition that these operators commute identically with respect to the spectral parameter uh, comes uh, up in this form. So we take the first derivatives of V to X, first derivative of U with respect to time with minus and uh, plus the commutator. This must be zero. So, we shall see below, we will be considering some special gradings of the corresponding Lie algebra, sorry. Uh, uh, of the corresponding Lie algebra. Uh, the potential will belong to the subalgebra G0 and uh, VK will belong to some linear subspaces which uh, complete G0 to the whole algebra. And uh, okay, below it will become clear how this is uh, done. So 
if we write down the commutativity conditions, then uh, they commute identically with respect to lambda, and therefore the commutativity condition comes up as a set of uh, uh, relations like that. Uh, the, we have put to zero the coefficients in front of the positive uh, powers of lambda. And so the coefficients in front of the positive of uh, powers of lambda must vanish identically, while the lambda independent term must vanish uh, if and only if Q satisfies the uh, corresponding modified KDV equation. So the first uh, M equations here will allow us to determine the coefficients Vs as uh, functions of uh, Q and its X derivatives. And the last equation will be our modified KDV equation. So in this way, with each simple Lie algebra, one can relate a hierarchy of flux pairs and hierarchy of integrable equations. However, uh, if we uh, put here matrices, uh, generic matrices uh, Q, uh, then we will get, uh, of course, integrable uh, systems, but they will be too complicated and uh, they will not be of uh, much use. Uh, however, uh, in 1981, Mikhailov uh, proposed uh, the so-called reduction group, and this is a very efficient tool which allows us to uh, impose on Q, on the potential Q of xt, a number of algebraic uh, constraints that will diminish substantially the number of independent coefficients of these equations. Uh, nearly at the same time, Drinfeld and Sokolov uh, wrote a seminal paper in with which they established the algebraic grounds of the Lux representations and uh, their importance in the theory of the nonlinear evolution equations. More uh, loosely saying, they uh, were able to relate the Katz-Moody algebras with uh, the modified KDV systems that uh, I will speak about. Now, what is the construction that is uh, provided by Drinfeld and Sokolov? And after that, after them, many, many people used uh, these constructions. So uh, let us consider, let us demonstrate how it works on the simplest non-trivial case when we have the algebras SLR plus one. And uh, uh, in order to do the procedure designed by Drinfeld and Sokolov, we will introduce uh, gradings in these uh, algebras. So uh, there are. Uh, Pronto? Yes. Sì, buongiorno. Eh, volevo avere delle informazioni uh, sul uh, documenti da portare e appunto per please. un visto di lavoro in Russia. Yeah, sorry, I'm just switching off the mic. Can you... Yeah, yeah, I will switch it. Oh, I will switch off his microphone, just give me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. So, uh, this algebra, SLR plus one, has a Coxter number. We'll see below what is Coxter number, uh, which is equal to R plus one. And uh, we will do the grading using two different uh, uh, automorphisms, which are known as Coxter automorphisms. The first Coxter automorphism is generated by this matrix and uh, R plus one by R plus one. The second Coxter automorphism is generated by a matrix which is similar to this one and which has, uh, uh, which belongs to the Cartan subgroup and on the diagonal, it has uh, the powers of uh, root uh, for the h. Omega is equal to e to twice pi divided by the Coxter number. So each of these matrices satisfies uh, the condition that uh, c1 to power h equals one and c tilde one to power h also equals one. So uh, in this way, they have uh, precisely H uh, eigen subspaces 
And so they split the Lie algebra into uh, H uh, uh, subspaces. And G0 is just uh, subalgebra, uh, commutative subalgebra uh, in this case. And uh, the others are linear subspaces, which uh, correspond to the eigen subspaces of the corresponding automorphisms. This is how the automorphisms act on any element of the algebra. And if uh, the result of this action is proportional to some power of omega, then X will belong to the uh, subspace GK. And similarly for the C tilde and uh, G tilde K. Uh, the property of this grading uh, is uh, very important. And this is that it, if you take a commutator of two elements, one belonging to GK and another belonging to GM, then you will get an element from the subspace of K plus M. And if K plus M is bigger than H, then we must take it modulo H. And the same about for the second grading, of course. Now, what uh, I'm giving here in this formula seven is uh, explicit matrix realizations for C1 and C1 tilde in terms of a set of matrices that are uh, more general and uh, which are represented like this. So EJ, J plus S is the matrix which has uh, only one non-vanishing element at the position j, j plus s, and this element equals to one. And omega, as you may remember, is uh, exponential to twice pi divided by h. So the elements of this basis satisfy these commutation relations. And we can easily verify which are the elements that belong to each of the linear subspaces in the grading. This uh, JSK are uh, in the first grading and uh, JSK again acting with C tilde will give a basis in the uh, second grading. So these uh, matrices have additional good properties like that. And uh, here is uh, the basis in each of the linear subspaces that uh, I introduced uh, already. And uh, we, I will work uh, now with the first grading here. And uh, I will need also the fact that uh, each of these subspaces, uh, GS, uh, has uh, just one element uh, which belongs to the Cartan subalgebra of SLR plus one. Uh, in what follows, we will need also the special operator, which is uh, taking commutator with the element J that was uh, part of the Lux operator. And uh, since J uh, was given as a constant diagonal operator, then it will split uh, we will need the splitting into a fetch matrix S into diagonal and off diagonal part. So when we take a commutator with J, we get uh, it X non trivially only the off diagonal part of X. Um, ah, okay. So uh, I wrote uh, once again the uh, equations that. Uh, give us uh, the conditions of commuting uh, the operator L and M. And now we, uh, the first condition is that J with K commute, they are constant diagonal matrices. This is obvious. And uh, then uh, the first uh, equation here uh, corresponding to lambda to power M uh, will provide us uh, an expression for M through the matrix to the potential Q. And the, we shall see that the rest of these uh, equations will uh, allow us to recover uh, some recurrent relations and we will express uh, all elements Vs in terms of some recursion operators. Uh, I mentioned already Mikhailov's reduction group. And uh, sorry, what happened? Yeah. 
aici. Nu. Sorry. Uh. So here are again the recurrent relations, and uh, we will be solving them. Uh, uh, we will solve for Vm and Vs. Vm minus one comes out to be just uh, this uh, algebraic uh, uh, construction out uh, on Q. So it is commutator of K with Q and that J inverse and uh, on the subspace uh, here at J indeed can be inverted. Then Vs is an element that belongs to the subspace uh, Gs. And uh, as we mentioned, we will split it into diagonal and top diagonal part. And we shall demonstrate that uh, Vs, the off diagonal part of Vs minus one is expressed uh, through V of the diagonal part of Vs with some recursion operator. And the diagonal part of Vs is expressed by the of the diagonal part of the same Vs with this uh, integral differential operator. It's integral of this, uh, these brackets here are the killing form. And we take some special Cartan element that belongs to Gs. And uh, here we have uh, the dual of this element. And these two Cartan elements are dual with respect to each other, with respect to the killing form. And so I'll skip the details. Uh, the, it's not uh, technically difficult. So as a result, we obtain this explicit expression for the recursion operator as an integral differential operator acting on uh, x. So we have at j inverse, and here xf belongs to the image of at j. So at j inverse indeed uh, exists uh, here. And uh, at the end, uh, we finish up with lambda 0, which is uh, uh, whose potential must belong to G0 and uh, G0 is commutative algebra. So it simplifies to simply taking the derivative. Uh, well, in addition, we uh, construct the master generating of recursion operator, which is the product of this uh, lambda zero, lambda one to lambda five. And so if we have some uh, uh, higher order element from the hierarchy that has dispersion law, which is uh, lambda to power 6k plus m, then uh, we have uh, 6h plus m, then uh, we have uh, the equation written compactly in this form. As you understand, uh, this will be a rather complicated equation, but uh, well, uh, writing it in this compact form will uh, simplify to us understanding how the, this hierarchy is constructed and why all these equations are mutually compatible. So the first example that I will propose uh, below is the modified KDV equation related to this uh, algebra, to Katz Moody algebra A51. I described already the grading and uh, with this grading, we have that the potential of the Lux operator is this uh, special six by six matrix, which has only five independent elements in it. So on the first step uh, above the diagonal and the last element here, we have the same Q1. Then the second uh, uh, diagonal above the main one and these two elements are Q2, etc. And the matrix J, that uh, uh, enters here is a diagonal, constant diagonal matrix, uh, and it consists of the powers of the uh, omega and omega to power six equals one. Okay, so uh, I'll skip also the details of the calculations. They are rather straightforward. So what we have here are the five equations 
that constitutes the uh, uh, system of modified KDV equations related to A51. Now, uh, you see here only four of them. This is not because they are not five. Uh, there is the fifth equation also, which couldn't fit into the, uh, the previous slide. And uh, this system is, of course, Hamiltonian. And uh, here is the expression for the Hamiltonian. And uh, let me go now uh, to, uh, well, if we want to solve this uh, set of equations, we uh, have to consider the spectral problem for, for this Lux operator. This spectral problem is, uh, uh, has a continuous spectrum, which is located on these 12 uh, rays that come out from the origin and that close angles of 30 degrees. And uh, it can be reduced to a Riemann-Hilbert problem, which uh, can be solved, uh, for example, by uh, the dressing Zaharov-Shabat uh, method. Uh, so, Thiris, how much time do I have? Okay. Uh, the second uh, example that I'm going to speak about is the AR2 uh, Katsmudi algebra. Now, uh, the grading is uh, uh, a little bit different. It is generated now by the uh, Coxter transformation C tilde, and it is uh, combined also by external automorphism, which is actually minus transposition. I suppose I don't have that much time to explain all the details. So uh, in this case, the Coxter number is equal to 10 and the, Lee, the corresponding algebra SL6 is split into 10 subspaces. And here are the basic elements in these subspaces. They were uh, shown uh, a little in the previous slide. And, uh, Again, uh, the, pro the grading has the same nice properties. Now I will use the second type of grading actually. And uh, now the potential Q tilde will be uh, the diagonal matrix, which is shown here. And which as you see has only three independent elements. And the matrix J tilde will be this uh, matrix proportional to lambda here. So it is, uh, well, it has this form. And uh, this matrix, uh, of course, can be diagonalized. And we will use this fact with the matrix U0, small u0. And when we diagonalize it, we get now the, this diagonal form, where eta is uh, exponential to 2pi divided by 10, by the Coxter number. Uh, OK. So uh, again, I write down the compatibility conditions. And again, we can uh, apply the same uh, technical uh, uh, tricks from the previous example. Only on some point, we will have to uh, use the fact that uh, we did the previous example with a diagonal J. Now J is not diagonal. So at some point, we have to make the inverse transformation uh, so, uh, so eventually, after that transformation, J will become diagonal and it will have these powers of uh, uh, eta on the diagonal. Okay, so uh, here are some details for how to calculate the compatibility condition. Uh, finally, what we get is the, this system of three equations for the three independent functions uh, here. And again, this system is uh, Hamiltonian. And now this is the form of the corresponding Hamiltonian. So uh, when we calculate the recursion operators, we have to remember that uh, now uh, not every subspace GM has a non-trivial element in the Cartan subalgebra. And uh, only, the L, only those subspaces that are labeled by a 
exponential exponent of the Lie algebra uh, will have non-zero uh, non-vanishing element HM. And these are the subspaces G1, G3, G5, G7, and G9. Uh, as a result, we get this uh, general form for the hierarchy of uh, A52 KDV equations. And here the master recursion operator is a product of 10 uh, recursion operators. And uh, here we have uh, the recursion operators that have even indices uh, just like that, at J inverse of DDX plus commutator, while the ones that correspond to, exponent to exponents of the Lie algebra have this form. Uh, as uh, this was uh, typical for the recursion operators before. Now, the spectral problem of this uh, Lux operator is a bit more complicated. Now we have 20 rays uh, uh, that form the contour of the Riemann Hilbert problem. In each of the sectors here, we have fundamental analytic solution. And if we are able to construct this fundamental solution, then uh, we will be able to apply the dressing Zaharov Shabbat uh, method and uh, to derive eventually the solid on solutions. And now, as a conclusion, uh, we constructed the gradings of A51 and A52 and derived the relevant modified KDV equations. We constructed the hierarchies of these equations in terms of the recursion operators. And uh, these results can be applied also to other Katz-Moody algebras. And we have done, for example, another example related to the Katz-Moody algebras uh, D4S. And this here makes one, two, and three. Now, what we can do in the, and uh, we want to do in the future is to construct the fundamental analytic solutions in each of these uh, cases and then apply the dressing method to derive the solid tone solutions. And uh, another, a bit more difficult but doable problem will be to derive the completeness relation for the squared solutions of the Lux operators. In this, uh, all in, in these cases, uh, this can be done. And so this, uh, one can see some, how this can be done in this uh, publication of mine. And uh, finally, we can construct the Hamiltonian structures of all these uh, uh, modified KDV equations and to derive the action angle variables in terms of the scattering data. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So are there any questions or remarks? Any questions by the online participants or remarks? Right, I have a question. Uh, well, a few remarks. I think there are a few, well, at least this print I mentioned, which is on the slides, but does not matter. And the question is, in the case D43, can you give a complete characterization of spectral data? I uh, only just to get equation. Can you solve this equation? Can you give a characterization of spectral data and uh, find solution explicitly, solid or things like that? Uh, I didn't hear it very well. Uh, there was some um, uh, three and spectral data. In D43. D43, right? Yeah. So for D43, we can do the spectral theory. I see no uh, problems uh, uh, apart from some technicalities that are not very difficult. So uh, then, what then? To construct the solid on solutions. Uh, yes, this, uh, this is doable also, but uh, it will be technically uh, much more difficult because how the corresponding uh, dressing factors must have, uh, I don't remember, 10, I think it was 10, 
So 20 poles each. Each tracing factor for one soliton solution must have 20 poles. It's not the, the question of poles. It's a question about the, the eigenspaces to, 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 to fit in, in, in this algebra, you know, after dressing. And uh, uh, the dressing factor must uh, belong not to the algebra, but to the group. And, 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 uh, and the group, uh, I know how this group is characterized, actually. So uh, acting uh, on this uh, uh, dressing uh, factor by the uh, generalized Coxter automorphism that goes with uh, D3, D43, uh, you must uh, get U inverse. No, that's not true. That's not correct. This is true. No, it's not true. This uh, group not act on uh, uh, this reduction group cannot act in this way or on the, on the corresponding basic factor that, that you can check. Well, when you write and you show the result, then, then we can discuss. But it's not a technical problem. It's, it's a fundamental problem. Uh, Sasha, I think this is true, but let us discuss it later on. It's uh, technical thing for the other part of the uh, audience. Okay. Okay. Right. And any other questions or remarks? So in which case we would like to thank you again. Uh, well, yeah. Thanks very okay. much. Thank you. So, so, okay. So it's my great pleasure to present uh, the next speaker and friend. So, uh, Paulus Sentidis from the Liverpool Hope University in the UK. And today he will be talking about symmetries and integrability of different equations. So, Paulus, you could start. Well, thank you, Sotiris. It's my pleasure to be part of this conference. Unfortunately, due to my teaching load, I cannot attend most of the talks. Uh, I'll do my best to attend tomorrow's uh, talks, uh, which are all of them are quite interesting. Uh, right, so this work is uh, about symmetry integrability of difference equation, and this is something that we started with uh, Sasa some time ago, so how we can determine the integrability uh, of a difference equation uh, using symmetries, and probably this is the most uh, rigorous definition of integrability, that to say that a, di a difference equation uh, it's degradable if it admits infinite hierarchies of symmetries. I'm going to explain all this uh, terminology in a few moments. So my plan is to say a few things about, first of all, just to define a class of different equations that I'm going to consider, say a few things about their symmetries, and then I will use this terminology to, to, to define the gravity conditions and uh, what they mean for the equation. And then I'm going just to use these integrability conditions as determining equations for the symmetries of the equation. So these integrability conditions have a dual role. From one uh, side, they justify the integrability of a given equation. From the other side, they can be used to find the symmetries uh, themselves. Then I'm just going to discuss briefly some extensions of this theory. What I'm going to discuss today is just scalar equations, not systems, but the exception will say, uh, will give some ideas about how these things can be extended to systems. And this work uh, is based on these two, the most two recent papers uh, on this subject. And uh, the point of view I'm taking here is just to, uh, to give a, uh, a nice representation of this declarability conditions, which can be used for uh, uh, computer uh, implementation to use them in mathematical or maple or any other kind of uh, software that you use. Right. So uh, just to make uh, some uh, give some reference about uh, some context about my notation. So uh, as I'm dealing with, uh, in, uh, with different equations or discrete variables, the independent variables will be denoted by n and m. This is more or less standard notation for discrete variables. So n and m are discrete. They take values in, in z. The independent variable uh, u 
uh, will be not for most cases with uh, the relative view. And instead of writing view of n comma n, I will just use this notation uh, as a sequence with indices, view with index n and comma n. And uh, in sense, well, since we are dealing with different situations, we don't have differential operators, but now we have a shift of operators. Operators, we shift the first, uh, the variable n by L. So the operator S to power L shift all the indices n by l and the operator t to power l shift all the indices indices m to m plus l so it's a, and again this is if we want to have a analog of the continuous case this uh, we could think of them as differential operators in in the first and the second uh, direction and usually because all of these equations that I'm going to consider and uh, the symmetries and so on and so forth depend not just on U, but also on a finite, but otherwise a specified numbers of shift values of U. Instead of every time you write down all the arguments of a function, I will just use this notation F with brackets U, which means F depends on U and some shifts of U like this one example here. So this notation could mean something like this. So F depends here in this example of UN minus one comma N, UN N and UN plus one comma N. Right, so this is the notation, common standard notation for different situations. Probably the, the new bit here is this shift operators. Now, what equations I'm going to discuss to consider for this discussion. So I'm going to, consider equations which defined on the consecutive quadrilaterals. So instead of just trying to understand that, it's better just to see this uh, figure down here. So what we have, we have say two parallel lines on the lattice, n is parameterized by n. So here uh, n runs from n to n plus t, and n is the same. And this is, uh, uh, is n, n plus one uh, up to n plus d plus uh, n plus one. So this, the equation, involves the values for the function u at this uh, point, and this uh, two d plus one points. And the values, uh, we, we have some special requirements about this function. Do we want this function to, be, to depend explicitly on these four external corners here, at this value here, the value here, there, or there? And actually, we, uh, something which is not written here explicitly is that we also require the equation that can be solved uh, uniquely with respect to any of these four values. And moreover, what we require, which is encoded to this uh, ugly looking uh, expression, is that uh, the equation, this, this function Q, depends on these uh, points between the external ones in such a way that it cannot be reduced to an or by a point transformation of the independent variables to an equation depending on a, on a smaller uh, stencil. Right, so do such equations which depend on this class when d is equal to one and d is equal to two. I'm just, this is one equation. This has also a name, this Hirota's KDV equation. It's defined on an elementary quadrilateral like this one of these four points only. And we can see that it can, well, it can be solved uniquely with any of these four variables. Another equation in the same class again is this two quad equation. This involves four, six points defined on these two consecutive quadrilaterals. Maybe it's not, but it's obvious that it can be solved uh, uh, uniquely with respect to these values, which is this and that. And also, but can be solved uniquely with respect to this corner here, which appears here and this one which appears only here. So these two equations belong in the class of uh, equations that I'm considering here. Uh, so uh, multilinearity is not, is not assumed, you don't need it. Uh, well, I, I, I assume linearity, if you like, in this uh, way only for the external values, not mm -hmm. for the middle ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, so what is the difference? Uh, what's the symmetry of a difference equation? Well, we, we can say that a function which depends in general on the independent variables n and m and uh, another of shifts of the function u is a symmetry of, the, of our equation if 
this, uh, solution, this relation holds here diffuse the facet derivative, which is given like this. Is we, what we do, we just differentiate Q with respect to its arguments, and every time we multiply this derivative with shift to power A and Q to power J. So this is the facet derivative acting on F, and this must be zero on solution of the equation. On solutions of the equation means simply that we have to use the equation and all of its possible shifts to show that this, this is uh, zero. A few observations here. First of all, that the facet derivative, this operator is a linear operator in S and T. So we, we can think that there's a linear operator in S and T. And in fact, for all the equations that we consider here, they can always be factorized in this form. A plus B times T. A is an operator which involves only the shift operator in the S in the, in the first direction and better B here the same. And so we have this nice factorization and this is very useful for you know, uh, for the decreability conditions. And also for our discussion here, we will restrict ourselves to symmetries which involve shifts in the first direction, like this. So this symmetry F depends in general on n and n, and shifts on uh, functions or uh, shifts of u in uh, of the form n minus m m up to n plus m comma m. And here, this capital M, is a number greater or equal to what, is the order of the symmetry. So we are going to consider only such symmetries for these uh, equations. And here is an example. That again, I'm going to use this quadrilateral equation, this Hirota KDV equation, as, a, as a, an example. Uh, uh, it doesn't show the whole. Uh, uh, uses the, uh, the, this theory in, uh, in, in, in its full generality, but it's a good uh, example for illustration. So in this case, the facet derivative is this operator here, which can factorize like this, as I've said. This is an operator depending on in, in S. This is another operator here on S composed with the shift operator in the second direction. One symmetry of this equation is given by this function here, and of course now one has to check that the facet derivative dq acting on f is zero on the solution of the equation. This is not a simple computation. It's quite tedious and cumbersome. So it's better to use for this kind of calculations uh, uh, some uh, symbolic uh, software for, uh, for, for symbolic computations. So this is an example of such uh, construction. Now, of course, we know that uh, swallow does not make string so we don't need just one symmetry here to establish the capability we need a hierarchy of symmetries of increasing orders and in order to construct such a, a, a such a hierarchy we need a recursion operator and a recursion operator of order n is a as a pseudo difference operator an operator like this form but here you see it's a composition of terms that involves this guy here as minus one to power of minus, so the inverse of this operator. And this cannot be represented as a simple uh, uh, linear operator. So I should, this, uh, at some point, we, as we will see to, uh, later, we will have to replace them with some formal symmetry. So if we have a, uh, a recursion operator, then the condition for this operator to be a recursion operator for equation for symmetries is this one. Here, B and A are again from the composition of uh, the facet derivative, uh, these two operators here. So if we have R and we have an equation A and B, and we have R, this uh, relation uh, is satisfied. And of course, this satisfied not only by knowing the operator uh, using for, uh, the difference operators, but we can, we can replace everywhere here all these operators with formal series. And then we can just collect coefficients of different powers of S. Of course, all the operators left and right in this relation here will be series, formal series in S. We just compare coefficients of S on both sides. And what we get is uh, a set of, uh, and actually an infinite set of uh, relations, which would, which what we call the capability for the equation too. So the equation, so, so the, uh, the equation of the recursion operators give rise to this decreability condition. And as I said now, instead of using this, it's better just to replace operators like 
so this, uh, this inverse of B and the inverse of A with uh, formal series. And for formal series, we can use Lorentz series, something which is something like this, the inverse of S minus one can be written as, as an infinite sum of this form containing only, well, in this case, negative powers of S. In general, formal Lorentz series could involve a finite uh, part which contains positive powers of S and an infinite part involving negative powers uh, of S, of the shift operator S. And in the same way, formal Taylor series, it is a series which contains an infinite number of positive uh, powers of the shift operator S and probably uh, maybe some uh, uh, finite number of negative powers of, uh, uh, of the shift operator. And in fact, for the recursion operator, and here, when we assume that this is of order n, we can replace it with a formal uh, Laurent series, which involves actually the derivatives of the symmetry that we are interested in. So actually, in this case, when r is a formal recursion, uh, is a recursion operator of order n, it's for a formal uh, Laurent series have this form. You see, this has a finite part which contains positive powers of S of the shift operator S, and then a, a part which an infinite part which contains all the negative powers of S. And in the same way, and the Taylor series contains a, a finite part which involves the, ne the negative powers of the shift operator S, and then an infinite part which contains all the positive powers of S. And in particular for the recursion operator, it can be shown that actually this here in the Lorentz series, the first n coefficients are nothing else but the, the derivatives of the symmetry with respect to these shifts which appear in the symmetry. Whereas for the Taylor series, the, the first n terms which, in, involve, which involve negative shifts of S uh, are determined by the derivatives of our symmetry with respect to the negative shift of U, like this here. So that means that we can use the, the integrability conditions and we can use them to determine the symmetries of our equation. And here, for, in order to use them as, as determining equation for the symmetries, we have to use both of them, Laurent and Taylor series. And if this uh, equation doesn't meet a symmetry of order n, the same order as the location operator, then these relations these determined equations will determine the symmetry up to an arbitrary function of q, so in some sense up to a point symmetry, if you like. And even though the, uh, the recursion operator may not depend on uh, the independent variables and then symmetries may depend explicitly on that. And but the the only drawback with this calculation is that we cannot find the term, uh, we cannot start, we cannot consider only the case when the order of the symmetry or the operator is equal to one. We have to use successively. So that means we have to, to start with equal to one. If the equation does not admit any symmetry of this sort, then we have to consider an equal to two and so on and so forth. And, uh, but nevertheless, the important thing is that all these determining equations which come from the degradability conditions are a linear system of functional equations. And now, uh, uh, for this one, we have developed also a strategy to solve them, you and uh, a strategy which can easily be implemented uh, in, uh, in symbolic computations. Just to give you a flavor of the, what these equations look like, you can see that this is a really nasty expressions. No one would, would like to memorize them. So the idea was here, actually, since we have this nice machinery using uh, 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 recursion operator for message, if we can just uh, find a nice way to write them uh, in a nice algebraic way. And what we can see from here that uh, the first coefficient in the, the leading coefficient on our operator uh, is actually is, det well, uh, is determined by this function, which is given in terms of our, the derivatives of our, equa of our equation. The next equation here in the left hand side, we have only the next coefficient in the series, and the right hand side involves 
are uh, the previous coefficient, which is determined already from here, and terms which come from the equation, and so on and so forth. So what we have here is actually, if we write it down, we can represent the whole thing as a lower uh, as a, as a linear system for the shifts of the uh, of the coefficients of our uh, operator uh, of uh, of our uh, recursion operator, which is the matrix on the on the right hand side is a lower uh, is a lower triangle. And actually, this can be done in a very nice way. I'm not going to explain the, 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 the key thing is that this relation here at the bottom of the, of the page, which uh, simply says the following. So the shifts of the first n coefficients of our recursion operator here written as a column vector is given by the product of these matrices. This matrix is something which can determine in terms, again, uh, of the equation, and this is same as for this one. And here in the in the middle, we have another matrix, lower triangular matrix, uh, which is uh, which contains the uh, the coefficients, the the n first coefficients of our uh, recursion operator. And this matrix, well, is here is its definition. So and and this is uh, 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 the the matrix that actually we need. And this actually. We can easily program this so we can have for any equation uh, defined on each uh, consecutive quadrants, we can have all these uh, determining equations which follow from the Lorentz series. In the same way, you can find something using the Taylor series. Again, the main relations down here, what we have here now, we have the, the shift of uh, the n first uh, coefficients in our recursion operator. Now these involve, this vector here involve the derivatives of our symmetry with respect to the negative shifts of u in a column. And here we have a lower triangular matrix multiplying this lower triangular matrix of our uh, vector r. Another matrix which again determined by uh, non uh, 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 determined by Q and the derivatives of Q. So again, this can be easily implemented in uh, any uh, 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 software for uh, small computations and can, can easily have a mid, have all the determined equations without no uh, computation. Now let's again here just using this simple quadrilateral equation and for this one seeking for first order symmetries of course, we will get immediately two equations. Well, because now we have just uh, only, uh, we can determine one equation for the derivative of f with respect to the highest shift, un plus one comma m, and one equation for the lowest shift, which is un minus one comma m. So we have two determining equations for these derivatives of f, which of course, along with our definition of our symmetry, the percent derivative, of f in the direction of q is equal to zero will give us will give us a symmetry to the equation, right? So here we have two equations which involve only the derivatives of f. So these are already uh, really good because we have just uh, one uh, function to deal. With. And here we have the same function shifted in one direction, whereas here we have the same function appearing f appearing uh, in, with, with four different set of arguments here. f depends on, of course, on all these three arguments. And in the left-hand side is the same function, but now with all arguments shifted in m by one. So here we have two different only sets of arguments. One set is this one from here, and the other one coming from here is the same arguments, but m changed to m plus one. Same here. So what we have here, we have one equation with one unknown function, the derivative that corresponds to the derivative of f, which depends on two different sets of variables. But of course, these variables are not independent in the sense that these relations must hold on solutions of our equation. That means all these variables are related. And so we can use this relation in order to simplify this equation, these two equations. Right, this can be done in a very systematic way. We can choose in a certain way to what variables to eliminate using our system, our equations. That's why we require the, the corners which are 
at the very end of this quadrilateral or this deep, deep consecutive quadrilaterals, for, for, with respect to these four va uh, variables, the equation can be solved uniquely. Because this, uh, this gives us already a way how to solve the equation and use it to eliminate variables. So we choose to eliminate in a certain way this, this uh, set of variables, and we remain, we went up with just with a, a smaller set of variables, which we call dynamical variables. If you like, we can think the external four variable uh, as sort of dependent variables and the remaining one as independent ones. So these independent variables are the dynamical ones. And, but of course, again, we don't have to do that. I mean, in every step, it's, uh, it can be uh, definitely as a very systematic procedure. We can be easily implemented in software and actually using this procedure, I'm not going to give all the details here because Starting with these two equations, actually, you can end up with linear system of first order PDEs for the functions, which actually, well, let me just show you the next slide to show you what I, what I mean. So from this equation here, using this procedure, we end up with this, well, I'm denoting with R tilde now this function just to make everything fit in one line. So this, from this equation, I can just derive this system of partial differential equation for Article for the derivative of f with respect to this function uh, shift of u. And this is a linear system for r over determined, easy to solve, is and uh, this determines r tilde, uh, this derivative completely, uh, and up to an arbitrary function, of course, and n and m, right? And in the same way, this equation here leads to this system that here. And again, this is an overdetermined system which can determine this derivative of f up to an arbitrary function of n and m only. So now we have the derivative with respect to this shift of u. We have the derivative of the asymmetry with respect to that shift of u. So we can, from here, we can integrate and determine f up to an arbitrary function only of u. Right, and then how we can determine that, we have just to go back to the definition, the very definition of determining uh, of the symmetry of an equation to, to determine. And in this case, this analysis leads to this answer. So this is the most generic first order symmetry that you can, uh, in the first direction for this equation. Here, this function f of n is this linear function of uh, n. As C not C1, some constant of integration, at least some constant which appear in this process. Uh, this uh, procedure, this uh, method can be applied can be extended to systems. And in particular, if we deal with system of quadrilateral systems and uh, which, for which we can assume that all these uh, uh, matrices here, uh, it's just uh, all these uh, draws can, if you like, with respect to these uh, variables u, n, k, m plus l. So what you do is just create all this. You take a, uh, uh, the matrix of the derivatives of the functions to which define our system. We just require them to be invertible. And in this case, actually, what I said can be easily generalized to all these kind of systems. Of course, uh, this is not uh, the most, uh, uh, this is the ideal situation when all these matrices are uh, invertible. Uh, we, there, there do exist systems which, for which this matrix could not be invertible, uh, are not invertible. And but even in that case, this can be done. We can define all these recursion operators and uh, integrability conditions. There are some certain modifications on uh, how we uh, 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 use formal series, but. Uh, beyond that, everything else is uh, the same uh, idea and can be used. And this is some uh, work still in, in, in progress uh, at the moment, how we can this generalize to uh, how we can extend that to system. Let's have, so let me just to summarize what uh, I've said. So the credibility code is from one side, of course, as the word says, justify, it can be used just to to prove the capability of a given uh, difference equation, but on the other uh, side, it can, be also it can also serve as determining the equations for the symmetries. And uh, the most important thing is that we can formulate them in a very uh, similar and nice algebraic way, and that can be used in any of these symbolic computations. In fact, there is some ongoing uh, work with Willy Herman to 
try to produce a nice mathematical package to do all these computations, uh, at least for some uh, from, from the some uh, nice uh, cases. Because you can understand that as uh, the bigger the equation is, the more uh, involved the computations uh, will be. And uh, even though the integrability conditions, well, uh, in some sense, though all these things were developed initially, having in mind a autonomous equation, they can be used very well uh, for, uh, easily for non autonomous equation. Again, the computations become harder. And uh, of course, the most uh, I've told you already that this can be also extended uh, to systems. So the question is if we can, how we can extend them to equations defined on other stencils. And the only thing is that uh, we don't have so many examples of equations defined on uh, other stencils, and we don't know more many things about their significance. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So, are there any questions or remarks? No questions from our side. Any questions by the online participants? Okay, in which case, uh, who may thank the speaker again? Thank you very much, uh, Pavlos. Thank you. So if you could please uh, then, um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, and then we saved the best for the last. So <laughs> it's, uh, Nikos, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, if you could, uh, yeah, could you please try to share your screen? Okay. Do you see my screen? Yeah, 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 that's perfect. So, yeah, if you okay. could, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, the, the last speaker for today is Nikos Kalinikos from the University of Warwick, and he will talk about approximate quasi symmetry. So, please start. Thank you, Sodiris. And I'd like to thank the organizing committee for this invitation. It's really nice to be here, even if it is just online. Um, so my talk is about uh, uh, basically about approximate symmetries of guiding center motion and quasi symmetry has really the, the, the lead role in this. And this is something we've been working with uh, Josh Barbie and uh, Robert Mackay. So before anything else, uh, let me first give you a hint or perhaps uh, uh, some motivation for quasi-symmetry. So in plasma physics, uh, quasi-symmetry is really the basic principle behind uh, uh, stellarator devices used in uh, fusion research. As you can see, they have uh, this shape of a twisted torus um, as opposed to uh, tokamaks, which have uh, uh, the, the shape of a usual torus that admits axis symmetry. Uh, tokamaks are the dominant uh, machines in this field. And so uh, what quasi-symmetry does is it guarantees integrability uh, with the purpose, integrability for charged particle motion, with the purpose uh, of better confinement inside this uh, tori. So uh, here's an outline of my talk. Uh, first, I will introduce the uh, equations we work with uh, which is called the guidance and the system. And then we will uh, address quasi-symmetry in terms of, of Hamiltonian symmetries. We will move on to uh, approximate symmetries and uh, give some uh, uh, definitions uh, and basically uh, to approximate Hamiltonian systems that admit presymplectic structures that describe the guidance and their uh, degeneracies. And then we will find uh, some conditions for approximate quasi-symmetry. We will relax quasi-symmetry to phase space symmetries and uh, even allow uh, the symmetries to depend on nu, the magnetic moment, and see what happens uh, for symmetries in magnetostatics in MHD equilibrium. Um, so starting with the guidance and the motion, um, again, before showing you the equations, I thought the picture might be better. Um, so, uh, guiding center uh, 
is really built on on an approximate symmetry uh, uh, from the start. Um, so uh, it assumes that the magnetic fields are uh, very strong. They vary very slowly in space and time. Uh, so that uh, charged particles, which are subject to the to the Lorentz force, uh, they rotate, they gyrate around um, uh, the magnetic field lines with some uh, uh, drifts uh, across them. Um, so what uh, guiding center uh, does is it, it, it averages out this very fast, small radius gyration, um, and it basically tracks um, the, 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 the center of this curved helix. Uh, so charge particle motion is a, a system with three degrees of freedom. So if we reduce it by gyro, this gyro symmetry, uh, we get a, a system with two degrees of freedom. So four dimensional that you see here uh, in equations one. So uh, let me explain a few things. X is three dimensional. Uh, v parallel stands for uh, uh, the velocity parallel to the magnetic field, which is one dimensional. Uh, B is a magnetic field, and we assume uh, that it lies on a, a three-dimensional manifold denoted here by Q. Uh, we assume that Q is uh, oriented in uh, Riemannian and that B is nowhere zero on Q. Um, so uh, the phase space uh, M is really Q augmented by uh, the parallel velocity direction. Little b is the unit vector field along the field lines. Uh, B tilde is the so-called modified vector field. Nu is the value of the magnetic moment. And uh, epsilon is our, our approximation parameter. Um, so um, we can express uh, uh, equations one in an equivalent way you see in, in uh, equations two, as long as B parallel tilde is not zero. And uh, by equivalent here, I mean that every solution of the form is a solution of the latter and vice versa. And the nice thing about two is that it has a, a Hamiltonian structure in the sense of IV omega equals minus dh. IV here is the contraction with a, a vector field V where V is the, the evolution vector field. So the symplectic form is given here by three where Vita is the magnetic flux two form uh, so it's just another way uh, of writing B, as you see, is the contraction of the volume form uh, with the magnetic field. So its action on, on any vector field X is really the cross product of B and X. Uh, written as one form, uh, this superscript called flat is just a, a way of switching from uh, vector fields to one forms. Vita is also known in plasma physics as the contravariant uh, representation. Uh, so B flat, little b flat is just the covariant components of B. G is the metric and omega, capital omega is the volume form on Q. And I should say that uh, by magnetic field, we mean a vector field that is divergence free. So this implies that uh, uh, the, the two form Vita is closed. And this system has also a Lagrangian uh, formulation given by the Lagrangian you see in five or equally by the Poincare Cartan form uh, LDT in terms of the modified uh, potential A tilde. You see down here. Um, if you don't like forms, you can think of these things uh, in terms of matrices. So omega is given by this four by four matrix you see here in seven where rho is the volume density associated to the metric tensor. And um, uh, uh, for epsilon, for, for non-zero epsilon, omega is a, a symplectic form as long as B parallel tilde is not zero, which was our assumption from the beginning. But if epsilon is zero, then omega is degenerate. And in fact, in fact, it reduces to uh, Vita, this three by three matrix you see here in six, which is also degenerate because it's skew-symmetric. And so uh, in this case, uh, or, or omega is a pre-symplectic form of rank two. And by pre-symplectic, we mean uh, a close to form that uh, is not necessary, necessarily uh, non-degenerate. So just a close to form.
And the question is what happens in the approximate scenario? What happens when epsilon is very, very small? So uh, we use Hamiltonian symmetries, and by that I mean uh, transformations generated by a vector field U that leaves invariant omega and h. LU here is the lead derivative along U. And uh, uh, we use Hamiltonian symmetries because then we have Nether's theorem that says that there is a, a constant of motion K, and the two are related by this relation I U omega equals minus the K. And as long as omega is non-degenerate, then uh, this correspondence is one-to-one, -one, uh, at least up to constant functions. Uh, here, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because uh, in the opposite direction, um, we only guarantee that K is uh, a local constant uh, of motion. Uh, basically, uh, we need some extra assumption to guarantee that if I U omega is closed, then it is also exact. And we can safely assume this uh, if we uh, uh, apply this lemma, which says that if there is a linear combination of the symmetry and the vector field uh, V that has closed trajectories that span the first homology group of M, then I U omega is not only closed, but it's only is also exact. And so I will use this as a, as a blanket hypothesis uh, for the rest of my talk. Um, so we, we won't deal with any uh, homology issues from now on. Uh, the same, we can do the, pretty much the same by assuming instead of Hamiltonian symmetries, uh, we can use variational symmetries that leave invariant the, the Poincare Cartan form alpha up to uh, close the one forms, uh, uh, or uh, also what is called Cartan symmetries. So anyway, we address this uh, for quasi-symmetry, which we defined as a Hamiltonian symmetry on Q of first order guidance and emotion. And by uh, symmetry on Q, I mean a spatial symmetry that does not transform the parallel velocity. So then we get uh, theorem one, which says that um, if a vector field uh, generates an exact quasi-symmetry, then it must leave invariant the flux two form beta, little b flat, and mod b. In vector calculus, you can see these conditions in eight, nine, and 10, where psi here is a, 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 an arbitrary function on, on q. It is usually called a, a flux function. And j is the, uh, the current density. Uh, it's the, the curl of b, uh, capital B. Uh, so the uh, equation eight give, gives you uh, flux surfaces. Uh, equation ten gives you symmetric field strength, and perhaps uh, the most unusual one is uh, uh, the condition in the middle, equation nine, which uh, uh, was not uh, really recognized in previous uh, formulations uh, until George Barbie uh, pointed out. Um, and so then by Nether's theorem, we have this invariant given here by K, you see in 11, uh, in equation 11. And uh, when these conditions, these three conditions hold, we minus to find some extra consequences, uh, namely that U commutes with B. So U is also a symmetry for the magnetic field lines, contrary to what was believed. Uh, it also commutes with J, the current density. In the second bullet, you see that exact quasi-symmetry is a uh, uh, volume preser preserving. And we have also proved that uh, LUG is degenerate and more specifically, it has rank two if it is not zero. Um, now, if we add uh, magnetostatics, uh, meaning uh, this equation 12, which says, J cross B equals grad of P, where P uh, is a function that uh, uh, represents uh, the scalar pressure. Then we found an analog of the Grad Safranov equation, basically a generalization of the Grad Safranov equation. So uh, the typical Grad Safranov uh, describes axis symmetric magnetic surfaces in uh, MHD equilibrium. Now, if we, instead of axis symmetry, we assume quasi-symmetry, then uh, um, 
and uh, we also assume that p is a flux function, then u dot b is also a flux function, and uh, the quasi-symmetric magnetic surfaces are described by this partial differential equation you see in 13. Now, um, the real question is uh, whether we can uh, prove that u is uh, an isometry or not, whether uh, 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 u is a killing field. Because if it is an isometry, then we back to axis symmetry. Um, uh, and perhaps this uh, question is not really well posed. What we need to ask ourselves is whether uh, there are no trivial magnetic fields that can support uh, uh, a symmetry that is not an isometry. Uh, so up till now, we, we have addressed only exact uh, symmetries and uh, an approximate symmetry or an approximate, approximate constant of motion might be just, a, just as good as an exact one, especially since the guidance of the system is an approximation uh, in the first place. Uh, so uh, in, a, in an approximate setting, uh, we introduce this approximate equality you see here in 14, um, which is really an equivalence relation a relation and it says that any two functions will be considered equal as long as uh, uh, they differ by terms of order k plus one where k is the order of approximation uh, and its equivalence class has a natural representative uh, namely the k order polynomial as long as we assume uh, enough smoothness around epsilon equals zero and we do the same for any anything uh, uh, on on the manifold M, uh, uh, whether it is a, a a form or a vector field or a map or whatever. Um, and then we define approximate Hamiltonian systems again by uh, saying i v omega equals minus the h, but now we uh, want v omega and h to be approximate. Uh, so for example, the two form omega is given by the sum over here, but we only require omega zero to be symplectic and we let the rest uh, two forms to be pre-symplectic, meaning just closed, but not uh, necessarily non-degenerate. And we use this definition for reasons that will be apparent very soon. Um, and so then we defined an approximate symmetry as a, a transformation uh, generated by an approximate vector field that leaves approximately invariant omega and h. Um, so then we, we get an approximate version of Nether's theorem that says uh, that uh, to every approximate symmetry corresponds an approximate constant of motion through this relation, i u omega approximately equal to minus decay. And let me go through the proof. Um, so uh, uh, the point here is that given any, any function k, uh, we can define u uniquely through this relation. Uh, as long as uh, it doesn't have uh, to be omega uh, non-degenerate, we, we only demand that omega zero is non-degenerate. And the reason is that if you split this order by order, as you see here in 15, then given k zero, uh, we can define u zero uniquely if omega zero is non-degenerate. Then moving to the first order terms, if k one is uh, given, uh, and we have found u0 from the previous relation, then we can define u1 uh, uniquely as long as omega0 is non-degenerate and so on and so forth. So this is why uh, in the previous definition, we only required omega0 to be symplectic. And then the rest of the proof uh, follows the same line uh, as in the, in the exact scenario. So if LU omega is zero, then I u omega is closed, and by a blanket hypothesis, it is also exact. And if L u h is zero, then as you can see in 17, k is invariant under uh, uh, the evolution of the system, the vector field B. And we can go in the other direction and in the same way using 16 and 17. But now uh, the problem is that if you remember that the guiding center form is uh, degenerate to leading order. Omega zero is not symplectic in this case. 
And if omega zero is degenerate, then IV omega equals minus the H, a given omega and H might not have solutions for V uh, unless DH belongs to the range of omega. It, even if DH belongs to the range of omega, V may not be uh, uniquely defined. It will, it, it, we can only define V up to elements of the kernel of omega. And the same goes for the symmetry U and the invariant K for Nether's theorem. So we need to add the assumption to Nether's theorem that uh, DK belongs to the range of omega. And then U, uh, 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 just as V, will, will only be defined up to elements of the kernel of omega. And these elements of the kernel of omega, we call them trivial symmetries because they automatically, they are automatically Hamiltonian symmetries. And as you can see from this relation, they will correspond to trivial invariants, just constants. So uh, if, if we modify the, the, the previous version, we get a, an approximate pre-symplectic version of Nether's theorem that says an approximate symmetry up to trivial symmetries uh, corresponds to an approximate constant of motion K with DK uh, that belongs to the range of omega. And the two are related by IU omega is approximately equal to minus DK. So um, we apply all this uh, for guiding center. We start with first order approximation. So we fix K equals one and start looking for first order symmetries. We find the range of omega that consists uh, of all the one forms whose zero order uh, uh, term belongs to the range of Vita. The kernel of, the, of omega consists of all the first order vector fields that belong to the kernel of beta. And getting back to our previous question, we see that uh, uh, in this case, we can say that the guiding center form in the approximate scenario behaves as a pre-symplectic form. So then we have, uh, well, what we can say as a guiding center version of Nether theorem. So we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between approximate invariants with level sets of uh, K0 being magnetic surfaces. That means B dot grad K0 equals zero. And classes of approximate symmetries uh, given by U plus uh, any first order vector field uh, that has uh, only B direction and V parallel direction. So, um, we apply this to, to the guidance of the system, and we have this first theorem that says that if we insist that the symmetry is partial, uh, that is, it lies on Q, then uh, we get these four conditions. And uh, if you remember this, uh, the, the first three are basically the same as we had in the exact scenario. So, uh, what this theorem says is that uh, uh, approximate quasi-symmetry doesn't really relax the conditions for exact quasi-symmetry. And here's a proof, I'm afraid I won't have time to go through it, but it's, it's not very, it's very straightforward. Uh, so then we thought, okay, let's uh, use uh, symmetries on, on, on phase space. And then we have this theorem that says uh, that an, a vector field U generates an approximate Hamiltonian symmetry if and only if these four conditions hold up to trivial symmetries. Now, the last one says that uh, the, there's no component in the V parallel direction. And the first and the third one are uh, the same again, as we can see here also in 21 and 23 in vector calculus notation. So only the second one is relaxed. Remember the second one was LU zero, uh, B flat was zero. Uh, so now it's relaxed, is relaxed to this equation or 22 uh, in vector calculus where X zero bar is uh, the vector field that corresponds to the one form LU zero B flat and is given in vector calculus uh, uh, from this expression where uh, nabla bar is uh, the gradient on phase space. And uh, in fact, we can turn around uh, 22 and solve for U1 in terms of 
u0 and psi1, which is what the next theorem says that uh, we leave the, the rest conditions the same. And then uh, uh, the, the fourth one can be expressed uh, from 24. So u1 uh, has this expression up to trivial symmetries, where psi1 is also a flux function, but it also needs to satisfy 25. And um, um, some further consequences from uh, uh, these approximate symmetries is here in the first bullet of theorem five that u zero is also uh, volume, uh, so is uh, divergence free, and it commutes with b, and also b dot x zero is zero. Basically, all these three conditions you see in the first bullet are equivalent to each other under uh, the first and third symmetry condition, so under 21 and 23. And uh, the next two bullets uh, describe some special cases uh, for uh, zero U1 or for spatial U0. Uh, the, the, the basic point here is that we cannot have simultaneously uh, zero U1 and spatial U0 if X0 uh, is uh, is not zero, which in a sense agrees with uh, the, the, the theorem for approximate uh, quasi-symmetry. And um, so uh, we thought uh, if we can uh, go in the opposite direction of theorem five, so if we can have conditions only on U zero and not on U one, uh, that will give you an approximate symmetry. And for this reason, uh, we, we define what is called a weak quasi-symmetry, which is spatial only to leading order, but depends linearly uh, 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 in the velocities to first order. And, and then uh, we found that uh, the vector field generates a weak quasi-symmetry if and only if these three conditions hold. So again, the first and the third one are the same, but now, uh, the second one is given by uh, the divergence of u0 equals zero. And um, let me say here that uh, recently was suggested that these three conditions can give you an approximate spatial symmetry, but here we prove that it is uh, spatial only to leading order. And uh, uh, it, in fact, it corresponds to uh, an invariant that. Uh, also includes uh, psi one, as you see here uh, uh, at the top of the of the slide in the twenty six. Uh, then we also thought, what happens if we allow the symmetry to depend on nu on the on the value of the magnetic moment, and we found that uh, uh, this is uh, this reduces back to uh, uh, a symmetry on phase space up to trivial symmetries. And also what happens when we add the uh, magnetostatics. And then we found that every symmetry on, on M is really a symmetry, an approximate symmetry on Q. So it reduces to uh, quasi-symmetry again. Which uh, brings me to my conclusions, more or less. So we see that uh, approximate spatial symmetries do not really relax uh, the quasi-symmetry conditions. Phase space symmetries uh, still require uh, flux surfaces and symmetric field strength, uh, but they indeed relax the second condition, LUB flat equals zero. And in the case of weak quasi symmetry, uh, this is exactly relaxed to uh, div u zero equals zero, but it's not a spatial symmetry. Uh, if we have uh, an approximate symmetry for one mu, basically we have an approximate symmetry for one mu. And in the end, I'm afraid that this uh, doesn't make any, any much difference because magnetostatics says that um, approximate phase space, uh, phase space symmetry is reduced to uh, spatial symmetry, so to quasi-symmetry again. So uh, what's next? Um, uh, uh, in order to answer whether uh, quasi-symmetry is an isometry or not, 
since we have uh, uh, an arbitrary magnetic field, the best way to deal with this is not to look for symmetry transformations, but what is called the equivalence transformations. So transformations that don't not only transform the uh, uh, dependent or perhaps even the independent variables, but also the arbitrary functions that enter the equation. So in this case, the, the, the magnetic fields. And in this way, once we find this equivalence group, we can factor out, we can caution out the isometry cases and see if there are non-trivial uh, magnetic fields that can support uh, uh, non-axisymmetric cases. Now, as we demonstrated, um, uh, perhaps guiding center approximations, it's not the best way to approximate quasi symmetry, but uh, perhaps there are other ways, partial ways to, to do that uh, more, more uh, uh, efficiently, uh, like the near axis expansions, which uh, uh, th there's a lot of work in, in this field. Uh, and this can also be addressed using symmetries and uh, even uh, normal form theory. Um, uh, and finally, in, in the end, we might have to abandon the idea of quasi-symmetry altogether, especially if it turns out that uh, there are no uh, really uh, interesting uh, non-isometry cases. And then uh, we might have to resort to other properties like the so-called omnigeneity that assumes that there is a second adiabatic invariant uh, given the, here by this integral of uh, uh, the modified potential over uh, closed orbits of zero or to guiding center motion. And it would be interesting, I think, to find what's the symmetry behind this. In my guess, it's, it, it, it is a non-local symmetry. Um, and here are some uh, references, if anyone's interested. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. So, are there any questions or remarks? Mm -hmm. Okay, probably not. So, in which case, uh, I'd like to thank the Nikos uh, again and uh, and Pavlos and all the sp uh, speakers of today's uh, session. So we continue tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock uh, Moscow time. And as usual, you will receive uh, a link to the Zoom meeting tonight and uh, to the YouTube live streaming tomorrow morning. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you tomorrow. Bye. OK, bye. Bye.